Good afternoon, everyone on the East Coast of the United States. Welcome to a momentum session for the 2021 annual scientific meeting for the Gerontological Society of America. This is part of the disruption to transformation, aging, and the new normal. And this conversation is about exploring the economic contributions of people 50 and over and the business case and innovative, innovative best practices for supporting healthy longevity. Um, I am excited to be able to be your moderator. I'm with ARP Thought Leadership Health, um, and I'm joined by, by my colleague, Peter Runlet, um, who is the Vice President of AARP International. With us from the Economist Impact team is Matt Terry, who is the project lead for the Longevity Economy Outlook, and Yushin Lin, who is also the project lead for the ARC 3.0 report at the Economist Impact. So, um, so just to give you an overview of what we'll be discussing today, in the first half of the session, ARP and Economist Impact, formerly the Economist Intelligence Unit, will explore the economic contributions of people aged 50 and older, specifically in the US context, encompassing their participation in the labor force, support of economic growth and job creation, donation of time and money to charitable causes, and the provision of caregiving support for family and friends. Furthermore, we will discuss the economic benefit of supporting working family caregivers and the economic costs of racial and ethnic disparities in life expectancy in the United States. So these are, that, that particular one is based on findings of two counterfactual scenario analyses that we'll discuss. Following this first part of the discussion, which establishes the business case for why it's important to support healthy aging and close the gaps in life expectancy, the second half of the session will feature a panel discussing innovating, innovative leading practices from across the globe. And these practices are highlighted in the latest Aging Readiness and Competitive Report, ARC 3.0 report. Uh, and these have emerged in a variety of contexts to provide a better, more equal and accessible access to care from across the globe. This panel will also share some key takeaways from ARC 3.0 report and how society as a whole can drive innovations and elevate healthcare and wellness. So with that, um, let's actually go to the Longevity Economy Report Outlook. And I want to introduce, um, again, Matt Terry. Um, everyone on this, um, if you want to know uh, people's bios, they're available in the program. But um, uh, Matt, it's been really great working with you these past, um, this past year on this report. But can you give me, like, um, and the audience, a broader sense of the history and context for uh, the Longevity Economy Outlook? Thank you, Erwin, for the kind introduction. Um, Appreciate that. So the uh, Economist's, Economist Impact, formerly, formerly the Economist Intelligence Unit, has been working together with AARP for the past uh, two to three years on the Longevity Economy Outlook Program. Uh, this is a research program that focuses on quantifying the economic contribution of people over age 50 in the United States. Um, we do this at the national level. We've also done it um, for each of the individual 50 states and Washington, D.C. Uh, one of the main goals of this program is to sort of shift the national conversation to one that focuses um, less on the negatives of, that are associated with aging um, to a conversation that focuses more on the benefits and the positives that are associated with, um, with aging and with um, older people in the United States. We, we know that the population of people over age 50 is rapidly increasing um, and is set to increase uh, much more quickly over the next decade, over the next few decades. Um, so this program seeks to look at what those opportunities are that can be tied to longevity. Um, as you can see in this slide, um, just to give you a bit of an overview of the timeline looking forward, um, people over age 50 today encompass four different generations. Um, millennials are set to join the group um, in, within the next decade, in 2031, uh, and Gen Z would be turning 50 in 2047. So we've got um, some big increases coming up in, in the coming decades. Um, and you can see along the bottom of the chart there, we've put some dollar figures on there, which represents the overall contributions of people age 50 plus and how those will increase over time. Um, this was a main 
uh, goal of our study and a main finding is to quantify what those impacts are. And it represents kind of a holistic picture of the contributions of um, people age 50 plus. So not just what they spend, not just um, what, what their wealth might be, but this represents um, all impacts of how they interact with the economy. So it includes uh, their labor force participation. It includes things like uh, taxes they pay, um, as well as, as money they spend. Um, we put all this into a holistic model um, that takes all of these uh, inputs and measures what the overall effect on the economy would be. And these are the, uh, these are the key findings that come out of it. So we've, uh, we've run this analysis for a few different years, 2018, 2030, 2040, and 2050. Um, and I think if we go to the next slide, we can see just an overview of um, some, of the, uh, some of the other figures that have come out of this analysis. So you can see in this um, initial section, the 50 plus age group is not only contributing to GDP, but they are contributing um, to job sustainability in the US. Their activities across the labor force and across uh, the um, economic markets in the US have an incredible impact on jobs and on wages. Um, you can see here that uh, the impact on wages from the 50 plus group has increased in the last three years by 12% and is projected to grow to 17 trillion by 2050. Um, the impact on jobs is also uh, very impressive with 88 million jobs currently being supported by um, people over age 50, which is projected to grow to um, close to 102 million jobs that are being supported by the activities of people over age 50 uh, by 2050. They also strengthen communities through unpaid activities and charitable caregiving. Um, now, this is kind of a satellite model that we have run as part of the study. Um, these types of activities include volunteering, they include uh, caregiving, um, things that traditionally aren't paid for, um, but are often provided substantially by, by members of our 50 plus community. Um, and in attempting to put a number on the value or, or the implied value of these activities, um, we've looked at the time that people over age 50 spend for example, on volunteering each year or on caregiving. Um, and in conjunction with uh, average wages in those fields of caregiving or different types of volunteering activities, we've estimated the, uh, what the contribution would be if, if there was uh, a dollar value attached to those unpaid activities. You can see here 97, uh, sorry, 97 billion is charitable donations, um, but 140 billion uh, worth of volunteering time has been spent by people over age 50. Um, in addition, 605 billion has been spent on unpaid caregiving activities, which uh, we'll get into a little bit later um, when we talk about our caregiving study that has been, that has been conducted. Finally, um, impact on tax revenue um, was the last major component of the longevity economy modeling. The findings show that 37% of state and local tax revenue, as well as 43% of federal tax revenue has been supported um, by people over age 50. Now, this is not the amount of taxes they pay, but this is the taxes that are generated as a result of their um, overall participation in the economy. So taxes could be paid by, by anyone, um, but these, these are the taxes that result from the contributions of people age 50 plus. All right, um, so these are the main findings from the Longevity Economy Outlook. This was the initial report that we, that we published a couple of years ago. Um, you can see most of the figures uh, reflect 2018, so everything's uh, pre-pandemic. Um, the next study we looked at, which, um, is here on this slide is about supporting family caregivers participation in the work in the workplace. Um, many people I don't think 
realize just how uh, prevalent family caregiving is in the United States. Um, I have the actual number here. So a recent study by AARP found that uh, there are almost 48 million Americans who provide uh, care to either a family member or a friend who is uh, age 18 and older. Um, and that number is a pre-pandemic figure. You can imagine um, more recently that number could have uh, definitely gone up. Um, of that 48 million, the majority of those uh, are over age 50 themselves and also giving care to others. Um, and in many cases, uh, these caregivers are not fully supported in the workplace. Uh, their caregiving often um, results in them needing to either cut back on their employment, um, moving from full-time to part-time jobs. It often results in um, them leaving the workforce completely, either um, as part of early retirement, or for an extended leave of absence. Um, things like unpaid leave are, are big issues as well. So uh, family caregiving does take a tremendous toll on, on both these families, these workers, um, as well as um, I think the overall capacity of, of the workforce in the United States. So this study on, on caregiving attempted to model what the impact or what the cost, I guess, would be um, of, of those losses. So because family caregivers are leaving the workforce and they're not able to participate in the economy to the extent that they otherwise would, um, what's the cost associated with that? You can see here these red bars represent those costs. Um, by 2030, uh, those costs will have grown to uh, nearly $1.7 trillion. Um, and you can see the trajectory is, is worsening over time with uh, um, that growing to a $4.1 trillion cost to uh, US GDP in 2050. We move on to the next slide. We also in this report looked at several different um, implementation strategies that could be, uh, that could be, I guess, instituted to expand the potential for these workers to remain in the workforce, um, either while still giving care um, or having options to, to help them with their care. Um, some of these we looked at are expanding access to the most popular resources. These include um, flexible arrangements for working, tools for teleworking. Um, these include bolstering public support programs, including government assistance and other assistance for long-term caregiving supports. Uh, they also include different employer support uh, strategies or policies. Um, these are some of the most popular ones we found in our survey of current caregivers. Um, paid leave, job sharing programs, um, flexible leave, I guess also fits under this one too. Um, it was also one of the most strongly, um, strongly appreciated supports that, uh, that caregivers uh, identified. And finally, executing a national strategy is, is an imperative for um, improving the way we support our caregivers. Um, efforts have been made on this front through uh, the RAISE Act, through addressing disparities and providing different resources for caregivers, such as uh, trainings and other things. Um, so that they can maintain, uh, maintain full participation in the workforce to the, the degree that they, that they would like to um, while, still, um, while still giving care. So this- um, that, Can I ask you a question yeah. about that? So when Go we ahead. talk about caregiving, I think the important thing to consider is that, that um, this is caregiving by people 15 older, but the recipients of that caregiving can be across the entire uh, life course. Is that correct? They can, yeah, they can be, um, we didn't look at childcare. That was one thing we, we left out, which is, you know, in addition, a big, um, a big part of care. You'll often find grandparents, for instance, giving care to their grandchildren. Um, but this, this study looked just at adult care. So care for people ages 18 and older. Um, and it's, it's quite prevalent, whether it's from, you know, health challenges that someone may experience or, or just simply uh, getting older. Um, the requirements um, for caregiving 
are set to really increase, especially over the next decade um, as the older population in the US really explodes. So, And all very relevant to some of the policy questions that are being um, discussed at the national level. Um, thank you. Um, so I think also this really speaks to, you know, um, I remember listening to um, Laura Carsonson, Dr. Carsonson from the Stanford Longevity Center talking about how our society, you know, is not really designed uh, yet for how that people are living longer and have these increased expanded responsibilities for work and caregiving and the ways in which you contribute. But yet, if we were to create maybe something like a healthy longevity society that we could actually tap into this. But what we need is to create the institutional um, support systems to actually help people achieve that. And I think this is what um, I think was really exciting about your study. Exactly, uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I think that serves as a good segue maybe into our next study that looks at um, the impact of life expectancy across different groups in the US. And I think that for, um, from ARP's perspective, um, you know, in 2021, um, we actually uh, began a um, cross enterprise strategy to address disparities by race, ethnicity. Also, uh, we have a new executive vice president that, um, that, um, that um, has in her portfolio um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And for us, you know, you know, the ability to enjoy the promise of a longer, healthier life is something that everyone should share equally. And yet, uh, from the reason why I think we worked with um, the economist impact was that this is actually not shared. That there are so many disparities by geography, by by race, by ethnicity, and um, especially um, by gender. And thinking about how these disparities affect um, African American men in particular. Um, so, um, so our question, I think, when we we, we posed to um, to you, Matt, was um, what are the costs of of these disparities in life expectancy. And that was uh, what we started working on this past year. It is, yeah. So this past year, we've been looking into those disparities. Um, as Erwin mentioned, and as you saw on the last slide, it really affects um, African-Americans, um, in particular African-American men, a lot more than other groups. Um, these bars represent uh, average life expectancy across each of these demographic groups. Um, and you can see the lowest one there is for African-American men. So our, our question was, what, it was kind of a counterfactual, what would be um, the effect of equalizing life expectancy in the US? What if there were no disparities across these groups? Um, what if we lived in a world where uh, everyone could expect to live an equal amount of time? And you can see the results from our, our counterfactual analysis on the next slide. Um, this is what we're missing out on. Um, so if, if we had equality from now until 2030, um, we would be missing out on 1.6 trillion toward GDP um, in 2030. It's a 5.4% projected um, increase over, over current forecasts for 2030. Um, we'd be missing out on 10 million jobs and missing out on nearly a trillion dollars in wages. Um, now, now, this represents kind of missed opportunities, um, I guess you could say. And, and one thing you don't see on this slide as well is the human impacts. Um, just in terms of the additional number of people surviving in the United States uh, over the next decade, if we, had, if we had equality of life expectancy, would amount to, it, it would be significant. Um, it would amount to nearly 6 million uh, additional people in 2030 who would be living, who would be working, who would be part of our, part of our society. Um, so yeah, an incredible impact that um, I think we're, we're really missing out on because of inequality, both across races and across, and across geographies, as Erwin mentioned. It, it touches on many different aspects of life across the US. And you know, Matt, as you mentioned, you know, this is an addition to the human cost, the loss, you know, uh, birthdays and anniversaries, the lost opportunities for grandparents to uh, be with the grandchildren, for um, for parents like myself to you know have mentorship from their um, their own parents. Um, but I think what's important in this economic cost is as we have policy debates about how we make priorities to realize that 
that as we um, that if we were to actually provide people an equal opportunity to have a longer, healthier life, that there are a lot of benefits as well. So I think this is what's exciting. But how we get there, I think that's that's I think the real challenge and the, the challenge that all of us must must take head on, and not only look at you know lessons from the United States, but also look across the globe. And that's what leads us to our next conversation. And I want to bring in my colleague, Peter, um, Peter Rundlet, who is our um, you know, vice president for ARP International, and Yushin Lin, who is uh, from the Economist Impact, um, um, to discuss these examples of innovation across the globe, and in particular, the Aging Readiness and Competitive ARC initiative, uh, uh, the third edition, which was just released. So I'm going to turn it over to Peter right now. Thanks a lot, Erwin, and um, thank you, Matt. That I'm really looking forward to seeing this next report. It looks fascinating. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Peter Rundlet, and I'm the Vice President for AARP International. Um, and like GSA, AARP is predominantly a US-based organization, and most of our work and attention is there. But our founder realized you know, early in our, in our origins that um, innovation uh, related to the, the uh, older people and solutions to improve their lives take place all over the world. And we can benefit from learning about those innovations and how other societies are addressing their aging populations. Um, you know, as you know, th there's a global mega trend, a global mega trend of population aging right now. But some countries have been dealing with this um, uh, and benefiting from aging populations from for longer than we have. And so we've taken this approach of looking around the world to see what other um, what other countries are doing, what other policymakers are doing, and how societies are addressing these issues to really take advantage of the opportunity of uh, this mega trend of uh, population aging. So one of the things that we did uh, on our team uh, back in 2017 is we started the Aging Readiness and Competitiveness Initiative. And really the idea of this was to look at what some of the major um, economies around the world were doing to address the global megatrend. And the first time we did this, the first edition was in 2017, we looked at 12 global, um, ma major global economies to look at the various ways in which they, this, these governments and uh, societies were addressing population aging. And, and then we, we did 12 in-depth reports on, on 12 different countries. Um, the following year in 2018, we looked at 10 smaller economies to look at, um, again, how they were addressing um, the needs of their aging population. And we have these fantastic reports that are on our website. And I'll, I'll probably say this a few times, um, aarpinternational.org where we have, this is really a kind of a, a central place where we gather all of our reports and things that we're doing around the world to highlight um, innovations and, and, and also to project some of the things that we're doing well in the United States that we wanna share with others. Um, so if you go there, you'll see a number of things. Um, and this year in particular, um, we have really anchored around this theme of, of healthy aging. And I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, last year at the end of 2000, um, 2020, the UN formally adopted 2021 to 2030 as the decade of healthy aging. And, and in, in October of this year, they launched at the UN General Assembly, this big initiative with the World Health Organization and others to really look at what other countries are doing, what innovations um, should be highlighted, how we can look at a, a variety of um, pillars related to healthy aging to really help us take advantage of this opportunity that we have and to address some of the real challenges. Um, and so we're, we, we, I'll talk about ARC 3.0 in a second. Um, AARP is, is deeply involved in uh, the global roadmap for healthy longevity, and, and Erwin can say something more about that in a few minutes. We um, have a project uh, with um, foreign policy analytics looking at uh, healthy aging uh, issues around the world, and we're creating kind of a hub on our website to gather these innovations across a variety of areas. And so I, I really urge you, the, even if you're focused on, on, on work in the United States, there, there's a lot of learning that can be done by, by looking at some of these um, innovations from around the world. That takes us now to our 3.0. We just released last week our, our latest report that we, uh, that we did with um, Economist Impact. And rather than look at a country by country approach this year, we took a kind of a cross-cutting thematic approach to look at healthcare and wellness, um, to really dig into that issue, to explore where the best things were happening around the world that we could learn from. 
Um, and, and, and I'll turn to Yushin in a minute to talk about the process that she went through. But it's worth, it's worth mentioning that, um, you know, this global megatrend has taken place in other parts of the world. And we're seeing in, in you know, the World Health Organization, for instance, identified that there are 140 million people around the world who aren't able to meet their basic health care needs. And that, that's a, it's a huge issue. By 2050, one sixth of the population is going to be over age 60. And though we are seeing that there are longer lives, that with our health expectancy, um, our life expectancy has grown, our, the, 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 the health span, the, the time during which people are living healthily or living healthy longer lives is not keeping up with the, the life expectancy. And so there's a, a divergence and there's a bigger gap between how long people are living and how long they're living well. And so that's something we wanna pay a lot of attention to. How, how can we improve the health span of people's lives. Um, so with that, I think I want to, we have a quick synopsis video where I can, can uh, give you a better sense of some of the things we're doing in, in this current version of the um, Aging Readiness and Competitiveness Report. Um, and then um, I'll come back on and turn it over to you, Shane. Around the world, life expectancy is increasing while barriers to accessing quality healthcare are at an unprecedented high. The COVID-19 pandemic has further stretched our healthcare systems, disproportionately impacting older adults and exacerbating health disparities worldwide. Governments, policymakers, civil society, and the private sector are now racing to turn the tide on healthy aging because the countries that address and improve healthcare will keep people healthier for longer, increasing a person's economic contribution to society over time and reducing the economic burden of long-term healthcare costs. The path forward lies in innovation to provide better quality care in a cost-effective way. And innovation has no borders. Now, stakeholders can access solutions to the underlying systemic issues that have served as barriers to healthcare access for decades. AARP's Aging Readiness and Competitiveness Report 3.0, or ARC 3.0, offers a thematic cross-cutting focus on healthcare with examples of innovative and pioneering practices found across the globe. ARC 3.0 is a rich repository of information from diverse geographic, economic, and social contexts. This report can help policymakers and other stakeholders understand how governments can ensure access to healthcare for all older adults, strengthen long-term care provisions and support for caregivers, provide care for older adults in crisis settings, Apply learnings from the impact of COVID-19 on older adults. Engage in multi-stakeholder collaboration to implement and scale solutions and understand the return on investment for a sample of programs included in the report. Case studies and best practices from long-term care, aging in place, crisis settings, healthcare access, and the response to COVID-19 are now available to inform and inspire leaders worldwide. ARC 3.0 also includes return on investment analyses for five of the innovations featured in the report. People of all ages deserve access to quality healthcare. ARC 3.0 offers the actionable insights needed for stakeholders to address and improve healthy aging. We can learn from one another, take a big picture approach, break down silos, and continue to capture successful innovation to provide quality healthcare for all. Learn more about ARC 3.0, visit www.aarpinternational.org forward slash ARC3. So that gave you a quick, quick synopsis of, of ARC 3.0. Um, and I do want to emphasize that the older reports, the ones we did originally on the 22 countries are really worth looking at if you're interested in going deep into some country policies. I think going forward, we're going to continue with this thematic approach, and we expect to, to, to do another one next year. We're working out the details on what focus we'll have. But this year, the, the health innovations were, it's, it was a really exciting process. And I'm going to turn it over to Yushin to talk about how the economist, how economists impact identified these great innovations around the world and, and to really highlight something around the return on investment impact analysis so that the, the innovations that we found, they can be replicated and scaled in other places. That's what we're hoping. So I'll turn it over to you, Shimlin. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here sharing some interesting insights and innovative practices 
we highlighted in the ARC 3.0 report. Uh, as the uh, video briefly mentioned earlier, under this ARC 3.0 study, we highlight innovations from diverse geographic, economic, and social contexts to improve health and care services for older adults. We also examine the elements that drive innovations and scale up and provides actionable insights for stakeholders. Uh, furthermore, we conducted return on investment analysis on select examples to make the business case for innovating for healthy aging. And lastly, we also shared uh, early lessons and experiences for the COVID-19 pandemic, which have broader implications for crisis response in general. So before I dive into specific examples of innovative practices, I would like to talk a bit more about, a little bit about our research methodology, how we define and identify these innovations. So oh, throughout the research, the definition we use draws largely from the World Health Organization's definition of uh, health innovation, which states, quote, health innovation identifies new or improved health policies, systems, products and technologies and services and delivery methods that improve people's health and, um, and well-being. And health innovation responds to unmet public health needs by creating new ways of thinking and working with a focus on the needs of vulnerable populations. So using this definition, we took several steps to identify innovative and pioneer, uh, pioneering practices around the world. We conducted a structured literature review using relevant keywords to identify interesting practices with a focus on those that have emerged, expanded, or scaled up in the past decade. We also focused on those that were not covered in the previous ARC studies. Uh, in the meantime, we spoke to experts around the world with diverse backgrounds to ask for their recommendations of innovations. So eventually from an initial list of over 70 identified innovations, Economist Impact Team narrowed to the short list of 21 uh, innovations, including in the final report, which represent a diverse, uh, diverse range of innovation focuses, geographies, and socioeconomic contexts. Um, so next, I'm going to, uh, I will go into some specific examples from our R3.0 uh, study. Uh, since we were discussing the economic benefits of supporting uh, working family caregivers and the economic cost of disparities in life expectancy, which can be attributed to unequal access to healthcare, I'm going to share some uh, share three innovative or pioneering uh, practices from our R3.0, which will end at tackling these issues. Um, so the first example comes from Greater Manchester in the UK. Realizing that family caregivers are often uh, overlooked in long-term care policies with their, and with their needs unmet, governments in uh, Greater Manchester have developed a, an array of programs to assist family caregivers through multi-sectoral interventions. They offered health-specific skills training to family caregivers, and the programs also support uh, family caregivers in returning to the workforce, receiving uh, counseling, and participating in local policy creation. And what I found the most interesting about this example is actually how they promoted cross-sectoral collaboration. So the region aimed to break the silos between the health and social sectors, and they started with merging the government budget for these two sectors, which really facilitated the uh, partnership between these two sectors. And with the new integrated budget, more than 30 local organizations are able to effectively, more effectively uh, support caregivers outside the clinical environment to ensure their needs are met. And then the next, for the next example, I'd like to share um, a, uh, the next example I'd like to share here is about improving equal access to healthcare. And we all know that inequity can take various forms. It could be seen among different races, ethnicities, genders, and it can also be seen across regions. Particularly, there has been persistent disparities in access to healthcare between uh, urban and rural areas in both high and lower income countries. So we found this very interesting example in Uganda, in Africa, where a social enterprise called Caro Health provides a variety of health and support services to rural communities. And the company offers solar powered 
telehealth clinics in rural areas to provide access to high quality primary health care through repurposed shipping containers. And the telehealth consultations are given by doctors in one of two urban centers who can then uh, provide diagnosis, prescriptions, as well as continuous medical education to the clinic's health workers. So today, the Carol Health Platform has a network of uh, 71 such container clinics around the country, deploying in 28,000 rural villages that have 2,000 or more inhabitants, but do not have a health uh, facility within a 10 mile radius. So, and since the late 2020, uh, this company has also trained rural nurses and health workers to provide uh, mental health support for vulnerable groups, including older adults during the pandemic. And um, again, what is the most, uh, um, for this uh, program, the collab collaboration has really been crucial to its success. The, the company has partnered with local uh, Rotary clubs and churches to identify older adults most in need of health services. They also bolstered the uh, technical aspects of their services by partnering, uh, partnering with uh, international organizations and uh, multinational corporations, including a German development agency and the uh, Merck and uh, Unilever. And uh, furthermore, it also relies on champions at the community level who are willing to start and operate coral health services in their locality. So this second example of a coral health platform is obviously a great illustration of how a private sector player can be the driving force to improve equity in healthcare. And the third example I'm going to share showcases how governments can play a leading role in addressing these gaps. So now we're looking at Costa Rica. Since 2010, the government, mainly through the its National Council for Older Adults, has developed a national community-based network to provide care for older adults in poverty or at high social risk, improving uh, health equity. And these community-based care networks in total, uh, there are 52 as of March, 2021, are subsidized and overseen by the government and they provide a wide range of services, including feeding, hygiene, social care, health prevention and promotion, uh, housing and long-term care, among many others. And this ne uh, the networks can also allocate up to 10% of the government's subsidy to hire professional caregivers. So this national care network is a product of uh, Costa Rica's legal and policy environment, which really emphasizes universal rights, including the care and protection of older adults. And the government also adopts a general policy approach, which uh, prioritizes community-centered and community-driven care with input from older adults themselves and delivers through a variety of public, private, and nonprofit entities. In addition, in 2015, uh, the government increased the program's funding, augmented with uh, social development funds and taxes on liquor, beer, and cigarettes to expand access to care. So, so far, this program has really successfully uh, created a safety net for uh, care, safety net of care for older adults who, uh, whose needs are, are met. So, um, I, I thought we'll start here, and these are just three uh, examples of the innovative pioneering practices from our R3.0 study. So, I will strongly encourage the audience who are interested to explore more insights and innovative examples from our study on the ARP International. Thank you, Yushin. Um, I know we're getting close to time, so I'll turn it back over to Erwin in just a second, but I did want to emphasize that last point she made. We are really strenuously looking to learn about innovations good programs around the world in all sorts of areas. And so, so please share what you learn with us um, going forward and we'll continue to share with you. Um, ARPinternational.org, it, we're looking to build out a global hub so that it can be the place where policymakers and stakeholders from around the world can come to learn about the things that they should be doing to help their older uh, adults. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Erwin, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Shannon, thank you, Matt. Um, at this point, uh, we'd like to turn it over to um, the audience, um, we'd love to hear your um, ideas, your questions. Um, and, but, and as you're um, sort of um, gathering those questions uh, for submission, I just also wanted to follow up on what Peter talked about. The National Academy of Medicine as part of their first grand challenge 
is uh, we'll be issuing a consensus level report, a global roadmap for health and longevity. And um, I think that, that from what we've learned from the ARC report, it's that this issue of healthy longevity is a global issue and that the, um, the challenges and the solutions will come from a global um, uh, theater as well. And I think that's what's exciting about the ARC report that you see different countries and communities with different levels of needs and resources still rising to this important challenge, which I think for me gives me hope as we in the United States try to address this issue of, of disparities in, in life expectancy and go on making sure that we can all have that promise for a longer, healthier life. Um, so with that, um, I am going to, oops, the, there. Um, I'm going to say uh, thank you um, to all of um, our speakers. Uh, we're all gonna stay on that, however, and at this point, we're gonna turn over uh, uh, to questions. So um, let me just pause and wait for the first question. So um, I think we have the first question if I could go to, to Matt. Um, so how does the COVID-19 pandemic change the findings of the Longevity Economy Outlook Report, especially findings for the most recent analysis on life expectancy disparities? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, the Longevity Economy Outlook Report was originally published in 2019, um, looking at 2018 impacts. Um, the, the forecasts though for that report were for 2030, 2040, and 2050. Um, those years naturally needed a bit of a revision um, since the uh, recent COVID-19 pandemic. So we've taken a second look at those numbers since then. And based on um, some of the forecasts that the Economist um, and the Economist Intelligence Unit put out, we've um, adjusted those, those figures to account for um, things like demographic changes as a result of COVID-19 um, and also uh, revisions in the economic outlook which I think over the next 30 years, we're now expecting slightly slower growth than we were before. So um, that would be the effect on the main report. Uh, I think you also asked about the effect on life expectancy disparities. Um, as far as that report goes, like I mentioned, we took into account um, a lot of those demographic effects from the pandemic. Um, but the majority of the analysis in that report actually looks at the post-pandemic decade. So from now until uh, 2030. So a lot of those um, elevated mortality rates that you might have seen um, both last year and, and somewhat this year will be less of a part of, of that analysis. So it wouldn't have as, as big of an impact there. You know, I think that the challenge for researchers now at this moment is that so many variables are changing both in terms of you know um, the economy sectors within the economy um, life, life expectancy by um, geographic areas by, by groups at the same time I think the other challenge and promise that we have to think about any um, you know any silver lining to this is that we have the potential to also create changes in our society and to you know not go back to where we were and to uh, but to actually build for better society a healthy longevity society that has equity in space you know and i think that we're seeing some of these um um you know as um, in some of these solutions you know Yishin, can you share any interesting practices or findings regarding healthcare and support provided to older adults during this pandemic yeah of course so actually we started our arc 3.0 started during the, in the middle of the pandemic so by that time we already we already saw that um, it was very obvious older adults uh, were bearing the brunt of the pandemic. And about uh, four out of five older uh, people who died from COVID-19 were actually people uh, aged above 60 years old. And also older adults, they face, um, um, they face that access to, uh, the, their access to healthcare is, is more uh, difficult because of the limited accessibility of uh, in-person um, uh, physical uh, visit, physician visit. And also older adults, they tend to face this, uh, more, face more challenging in assessing uh, telehealth. 
Uh, and we also see, saw that a social isolation threatened their physical and mental health. Uh, and uh, long-term care facilities there, they uh, also were negatively affected by um, uh, COVID-19 uh, a lot. So with that in mind, we were actively looking for uh, practices that coming out uh, during the pandemic that were, were aimed to address the pressing needs. So we, we identified uh, uh, quite a few, and but among them, we, we sort of, um, uh, seen generally, there are three uh, general main uh, methods among these innovative practices. One is to adapt uh, these existing models or expanding established networks in order to meet these uh, pressing needs during pandemic by older adults and other um, vulnerable groups. Secondly, we see that um, the, the second general method is really to mobilize individuals. Uh, more specifically volunteers to care for and uh, support vulnerable groups, uh, including older adults. Largely, uh, lastly, we also saw that the um, um, uh, technology has has playing uh, has been playing a an important role in terms of facilitating the access and uh, older adults access to the uh, different care and service uh, provision. So I can very quickly share two examples. One, the first example was uh, was uh, came from the uh, Vietnam, where we saw that existing community networks uh, are leveraged to support older adults. So in Vietnam, as of twenty twenty, there are about um, more than uh, 3,400 uh, clubs, intergenerational self-supported, uh, uh, self-helped clubs across the country. So these clubs, they are basically a uh, community-driven initiative to promote um, health aging through a range of uh, self-supported uh, interventions. So in normal time, regular times, they in normal times, they provide uh, activities such as the uh, organized activities include uh, uh, health visits and care, uh, different types of uh, social activities, microfinance and technical assistance and uh, rights awareness activities. But during, during uh, the pandemic, because of this club's uh, versatility, they were able to very quickly pivot their clubs to use their current health uh, volunteers and networks to spread information about the uh, pandemic, to distribute the uh, masks and the food as needed, and also to continue with the uh, health-related uh, checkups to ensure members, um, particularly those vulnerable groups, who have access to the uh, necessary important support. Uh, so this is one from uh, one example from Vietnam, uh, which is uh, leveraging existing network and mobilizing uh, volunteers. Uh, the second, the second example uh, comes from uh, UK. So. Uh, in UK, we saw that a, a major uh, national volunteer organization, they work with uh, the, the government, more specifically the National Health Service, and partner, also partner with the tech company, uh, app, develop, uh, app development, uh, developer company, to uh, build this app, which allowed them to connect volunteers around the country to uh, beneficiaries across uh, multiple services uh, during the pandemic using geolocation information technology. And they provide uh, a wide range of services, including medi uh, medication and grocery job off, uh, check-in and chat conversations, and uh, more advanced services like uh, uh, patient transportation, technology delivery, delivery et cetera. So uh, really it has, uh, it has proved to be a very um, effective way to, uh, to support uh, older adults and our other groups during the pandemic. Yeah, so I will stop here. Back to you. You know, I, I think the, the that sort of theme of connecting, mobilizing, you know, and and, and using new technologies is something that we see, um, uh, yeah, across uh, um, across the uh, the aging field, and I think. Um, you know, this idea of, of even also going back and using existing clubs, I think that's very exciting. Uh, really speaks to how um, sort of the value of civil society and, and social capital can benefit us at all times. And also going forward, how we're creating new um, social capital through these um, um, interconnections um, online. I, I just wanna remind people that they can post questions um, on the um, either on the chat or on the question answer function. Um, uh, but um, we have one more as you wait for additional ones. Um, 
So Peter, how does the ARC report fit into other projects ARP is supporting, especially ARP International, such as the Decade of Healthy Aging? Uh, thanks, Erwin. You know, at AARP International, really what we're here for is to really be surfacing innovations, good ideas, practices from around the world. And in this era we're in right now with this kind of global mega trend of aging, we feel like there's no shortage of ideas and there's 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 plenty of work in front of us. Um, we're going to stay on these themes. Um, you know, as you mentioned, the UN just last year um, declared 2021 to 2030 as the decade of healthy aging. And we're really going to leverage that platform, the platform of the United Nations and the World Health Organization to identify solutions, to identify problems and, 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 and opportunities. So ARC 3.0 is, is one of our first um, efforts that, that goes in that direction. We've also just completed a project. Um, and if you go to innovationandhealthyaging.com, or better yet, just come to aarpinternational.org, um, where we, we, we link to all of our products, we've really looked at some of the issues related to, to healthy aging. What, what, what kinds of things affect that? And that goes beyond medical care. And we've talked about that. We're looking at issues that affect um, communities and age-friendly communities. We're looking at um, personal wellness issues and loneliness, isolation. Um, and there's just a lot of things that come into really promoting healthy aging. So in addition to ARC 3.0, we'll have ARC 4.0, and that's gonna take us looking at, it, next year we'll be looking at um, different issues around, around the world that we can, we can learn from here. Um, at the same time, by working with the World Health Organization and lifting up some of the good work of the organization, I think we can proliferate good ideas. We wanna bring them in, but we wanna share them. Um, we're really working to develop at AARP International, um, a central hub on our website, a place of connecting people. As you know, Erwin, over the last year, we held over three dozen, um, brought together over three dozen experts from around the world to look at some of these issues. And we're trying to really capture these insights so that we can create models, um, really legal policy and private sector models to help promote healthy aging. So, uh, and I know that you're, um, you're, you're really um, working closely with the National Academy of Medicine on the, on the Global Roadmap for Healthy Longevity. And these things all come together. So we're just getting started. There's a lot of work going on, but we're looking forward to doing more. And so Peter, when would we be able to see a global uh, longevity economy report, you think? Well, uh, you're, you're, uh, you're giving me one of your headlines, Erwin. I'm, I'm really excited to say that we're, we'll be working with Economist Impact throughout the course of next year to do a global longevity economy report. And, and with that work, um, we'll be looking at 64 different countries, really digging deep into um, analyzing the, uh, the, the uh, longevity economy in those countries and looking at um, the relationship with life expectancy and taking a look at uh, global life expectancy because there is a global megatrend. We're seeing that countries around the world uh, are living, people are living longer lives and, and something we can learn from how they're approaching this. Can we, can we give them insights about um, how they should approach it and make sure they're aware of the dynamics and also the benefits and opportunities that come with um, longevity economy? I might ask Yushin or, or Matt to jump in on that because they'll be, be running a lot of that work for us. Yeah, I'm happy to just jump in. Um... I think you covered the basics, but um, we are excited to be looking at such a wide array of countries. Um, we'll be putting together figures about the longevity economy in each of those countries, um, looking at particular demographic trends um, within each one, um, but also looking at the, um, the world as a whole and, and looking at the contribution of older people um, across the globe and, and, and kind of putting a holistic lens on that. So. Very excited for what's coming up. Um, you know, Matt, while you're on the screen, I just want to follow up another question. One of the things I think that we've seen in the U.S. and also internationally is this idea of the, the great resignation. Um, and, and how do the findings of the Longevity Economy Caregiving Report reflect caregiving narratives you have seen surrounding the current trend for people to leave the workforce, in part because of the, the demands of caregiving? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, if, if you're not aware, um, the great resignation is kind of an ongoing trend that's been um, quite prevalent during the pandemic where people are leaving the workforce, leaving their jobs, um, often not by choice, but to um, 
you know, take care of either caregiving responsibilities or, or other responsibilities that have come up. Um, and so that's been an ongoing trend that's been happening, but it is definitely tied into some of the trends that we've seen as part of our caregiving analysis and um, some of our other analysis around uh, trends in the workforce. I think one of the most important aspects we looked at during our caregiving study was how this affects um, different groups in different ways. So women, for example, are much more likely to leave the workforce or to take the pay cut um, or to retire early because of caregiving responsibilities. Um, that's something we found um, that's quite prevalent across the research. And I think combining that with the fact that women in general make up the majority of caregivers um, just speaks to the, the sheer impact um, that this is having on, uh, on women as a whole, um, as opposed to men that I think the figure we came up with in our report was that um, women experience three times more um, of an impact to, um, to their contribution in the economy as a result of, of their being unable to participate in the workforce as much because of these issues. So yeah, it, it definitely is something that, um, that ties together with a lot of the work we've done. You know, and I think what will the is important about that report in particular is that when we think about supporting caregivers, we often think of it and measure it by the cost required to provide those supports to allow people to care for the people they love. But in fact, in providing those services, your report actually shows that there is a tremendous economic upside, aside from the, the moral value of being there for the care for your loved ones, there is an economic benefit as well. And I think that's really it's insightful um, and important as, as these conversations are occurring in, among policymakers as we speak. Um, we have four uh, minutes left. So I'm gonna last, say the last two questions for Peter and Yushin, and it's gonna, I'll let either of you answer. So you both know this ARC report pretty well. Of all the, you know, and travel has been limited in the past 500 days. Of all the uh, um, countries that have been highlighted, all these models that have been demonstrated, which are the, models that you would love to visit in person um, in the future? Well, Erwin, you know, as the head of AARP International, I think it's really important that we increase my budget so I can go to all of them. Um, um, joking aside, you know, there's, there's really a number of great innovations to look at. I think that the one that probably captures my interest most to a place I have not traveled before is Vietnam. I, I think these, um, the intergenerational self-help clubs it's just a really interesting model and they've, they've really been proliferating. And I feel like it's a model that could be taken up in other places around the world. And so I would love to go explore those better. You should. So for me, it's like, like Peter, I also wanted to visit as many of these uh, models and regions as possible. Uh, but if I have to name one, uh, coincidentally, it's also one in Asia, I would say uh, it's uh, Taiwan. So Taiwan is really uh, known for its uh, long history of this uh, bottom up or grassroots movement of uh, uh, in terms of a build in an effort to build a very uh, age friendly society. And in a healthcare uh, system, particularly, they have uh, tried to establish a, uh, a system to accredit uh, age friendly healthcare institutions since uh, uh, early 2000. And what they do is they basically come up with a set of uh, uh, criteria that uh, uh, healthcare institutions they have to follow in order to be certified to certified as uh, age friendly institutions. And they started with healthcare uh, institutions, and then they adapted the uh, uh, continue to optimize the criteria and adapted the uh, criteria and expanded into the uh, long term care. Uh, institutions. So today, I think as at the end of but by the end of 2019, two thirds of healthcare institutions in Taiwan they were, they were certified as uh, age friendly, and five percent of long term care institutions were also uh, age friendly. So for me, I would really love to visit there, uh, to go there and visit these uh, institutions to see really like how they implement these uh, their practices on the ground. And I would just jump in to say like that that. 
program is like a policymaker's dream because with some small incentives by the government, you can really change the field. And that's what we've seen in Taiwan. And, and I think the report points out that three or four other countries at least have been looking at that model. And that's the, the kind of proliferation we'd like to see of good ideas. And that's exactly where I would love to end uh, with these promising um, proposals and turning it over back to the audience. You're the ones who will develop these policy proposals and new solutions. So I look forward to next year's uh, momentum session where to, we'll hopefully hear more of that. So with that, um, I wanna wish everyone a thank you for participating, both the, our speakers and the audience. And please, as always, stay safe, everyone.